All right, good evening. Uh, continuing in our Parsha series, um, we are now middle of the book of Devarim, the, excuse me, the book of the Midbar, the book of Numbers, um, the book of the Jewish people in the desert. Um, so last week's Torah portion, if you remember, I'll recap a little bit, ended with, again, a description of the inauguration of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, of this structure that the Jewish people created in the desert, according exactly to the way God um, specified to be made exactly the way I tell you, it was made exactly the way God told the people to do it. And at the end, in the, the inauguration of this tabernacle involved every single um, tribe bringing a bringing offerings, bringing sacrifices on the inauguration of the period of the inauguration. Inauguration. So there were twelve days of bringing offerings. Um, each tribe had a nasi, had a prince who would bring the offerings. The tribe that didn't have a representation of bringing offerings was the tribe of Levi. Um, and uh, so this is where we pick up this week's Torah portion, where Aaron from the tribe of Levi. Um, is sad. <laughs> Aaron, who is the high priest, Aaron, who gets to take the offerings, bring them onto the altar, do so much service in the tabernacle itself, asks God for something. Like he feels left out. Everybody else, all the other tribes are bringing their offerings. I, Aaron, don't get to bring an offering. And, and from there, we kind of learn something about this yearning that Aaron had to connect to God, to bring these offerings, to somehow be part of the collective. The collective were bringing, every single other tribe was bringing their offerings and being part of this big inauguration. And even though Aaron had a different job, he wanted that job, he wanted that, you know. So we learn from here this concept of envy. You know, we had spoken previously where there are certain character traits that, um, there's a middle road, right? So you don't want to be so generous that you give everything away, but you don't want to be so stingy that you give nothing away. So you want to follow the median, the golden, the golden median, the middle road. Um, we also spoke before about how anger has no medium. Like there's no place for anger at all. We have to wipe anger out from our, from our midst somehow. How we do that is uh, complicated, but there is a, an idea that anger isn't a, isn't a, isn't an emotion that we um, that that is good for us. We have to try to work against getting angry. But here there's a there's a maybe a focus on jealousy or envy. Here Aaron wanted to do what the other people were doing. He wanted to bring the offerings. He wanted to be part of that. And so God said, I understand that. That's not what going, you're going to do. You, Aaron, and your descendants get the um, work of lighting the menorah. Get lighting the menorah, right? We still have the menorah today. And in fact, there were two things that Aaron um, Aaron was given to do that continue to this very day. So one is the lighting of the menorah that he got to do in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, that then continued into the menorah that was in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and continues today with our lighting of the menorah on Hanukkah. That was all the Hashmanayim were, were descended from Aaron, um, the high priest. So we have this, this continuation through the ages of lighting the menorah that started back here in the Mishkan, started back in our Torah portion, where we learn about Aaron being, said, being, being jealous, wanting to do this. God says, no, you get to light the menorah and you also get to bless the people. And we talked about that last week, how the Birchas Kohenim, the blessing of the nation that the tribe of, of Aaron get to do even today in Israel every day, in, uh, outside of Israel on the holidays, on the high holy days, um, on the, 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 the Pesach, Passover, Shav, uh, Shavuot and Sukkot are days where the Kohen gets up and he blesses through through you know god's blessing the nation but he's the one who's like the conduit for the blessing we talked about it last week but these are things that continue to this day so i think that what permeates this week's torah portion this week's torah portion is called bah um which means to raise up so it says in the beginning hashem spoke to moses saying speak to aaron and say to him when you kindle the light Towards the face of the menorah shall the seven shall the seven lamps cast light. So we're we're God saying you Moses, you Aaron you get to light the menorah you get to kindle it you get to step up there and and put the flame there and make the flame rise up. And I think again the the idea of what permeates through our Torah portion is a concept of striving towards holiness, striving to connect to God, trying to be part of something bigger and transcendent and not 
so um, physical, something spiritual, something elevated, says that um, that the um, that the that the candle, a candle, that a candle is like a fl that has a flame, and that our soul is like the candle of God. That we have an aspect in us that needs to rise up. We've spoken many times about a soul being something that 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 that, that is spiritual, that is connected to God, and that we want we want to use it to raise ourselves up to look upwards. The menorah is the work of the. Of, of Aaron is to light the menorah, is to take earth and, and raise it upwards, to bring it up into the heavens, to, to look up, to raise ourselves up, to, to, to when we light a candle, um, we, we don't let go of our own spirituality. We actually, we actually transfer spirituality, but we elevate the spirituality. Our spirituality doesn't diminish when we, when we light a candle, our flame doesn't diminish, doesn't go out, doesn't get less. We, in fact, it gets more as we put our flame onto another flame and that catches fire and that raises up so so we don't get diminished the other flame gets to be enlightened and to, and to and to raise itself up and we also get to raise up so this whole idea of what it was that Aaron was given in this week's Torah portion he was given this this uh, work of lighting a menorah, of lighting flames, of inflaming people. And it says that Aaron, there are two qualities about Aaron that we can learn about. One was his intense humility. And we've also learned that about Moses being the most humble of all people, but Aaron also was very, very humble. And his humility of having this job, having the job of lighting menorah, having the job of blessing the people. He didn't get all arrogant. He didn't get egotistical. He stayed really humble. He had his eye on the goal. He understood it wasn't about him. It was about him spreading light and spreading Torah. It says in the Holy Temple that the light, when, when they would light the menorah inside the, inside the temple, that the windows... Um, were very narrow on the inside and then they would open out um, and sort of and br like like go from 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 small to big so you would you would look out it would shed the light out right it was about spreading the light out the light emanated from inside the temple from the menorah and it would spread out Right, and that's again a message for us. Like we have to spread that light out. We have this candle of God that's inside of us. We have the light inside of us. Like how do we spread that out? Then you know we think about that. We can talk about that. But I think this is a message for this week's Torah portion. Is about spreading the light that we have inside of us. When Aaron is said, no, you don't get to bring the sacrifices like the other um, tribes, but you get to do this. You get to light the menorah. You get to bless the nation. You get to spread the light out. You get to elevate. You get to like light the other flame. Right. Can we light our own flame, number one? And can we light other people's flames? Can we inspire our children? Can we inspire our spouses? Can we inspire our communities? Even when we're in COVID lockdown and quarantines or whatever we are in, like to, and we, we, we cross the street when we see someone coming the other way, but yet we can still somehow find conduits for increasing spirituality, increasing the light and letting that light go up. So I think that that's, a, that's the number one. So I think that the pervasive message that I'm going to thread through all the different episodes in this week's Torah portion are about elevation, about coming close to God, about bringing transcendentness into our life, about something that we yearn for is the transcendent. And it's there, and it's there for us to get at. So the menorah had seven candelabras, seven branches, right? Three on one side, three on the other side, and one in the middle. And it's about this, the one in the middle. The one in the middle, says many of our commentators, um, two things, is it represents Torah, represents um, a connection, a guidebook, how to live our lives. If we focus on it, what's in the middle? What do we focus on? What is all our activity um, kind of centered around? We talked about this before with the with the uh, Mishkan, with the tabernacle being in the center of the camp. It was what the camp revolved around, like there were spokes of a wheel outside of the center. The center was the Mishkan, was the tabernacle. And here we have it again in the in the menorah, that the menorah had this middle flame, which was all the center of, like our Ne'er Tamid in our synagogues is representative of that, it never went out. That Ne'er Tamid that we have in our synagogues, still burning. And it's actually interesting, it says in the, uh, in the, in the Medrash that, after the uh, the holy ark and everything was buried deep beneath we don't exactly know where it is but that that candle that that near tamir that uh, that menorah is still lit to this day 
like we don't know where it is, but it's still lit today. That's a kind of interesting thing to think about. So what's in the center? Torah is in the center. Shabbos is in the center. The idea of the of the Sabbath. You know, we've talked before about what what keeps the Jewish people going. Is it is it the Sabbath that keeps us going, or do we keep the Sabbath going? Like we're so intermingled with Sabbath as a way to testify for God being the creator of the universe, for God being the one who brought us out of Egypt, for God being the one that's always with us, that gives us this day of rest to rejuvenate and to and to uh, like and to and to build ourselves so we can like continue and shed the light into the into the into the week that what we do on that sabbath is so crucial to who we are in our work days that that is the center of our week is focusing on the sh on the sabbath and then what we bring with us into the week comes from what we did on that sabbath so a central a central um focus of the jewish people's consciousness is God, Torah, and Sabbath. So like that's kind of like what's represented as that middle branch that the three other ones on either side is, are facing. So the first thing we learned about in this week's Torah portion is Aaron asking for being able to be like the other tribes, being told, no, you get the menorah, you get blessing the nation. That's what you get, that's your job, that's what you have to do, that's where you, where you will shine. So the next thing we learn about is a similar idea. It's about um, the people, the people who carried the bones of Joseph um, when the Jewish people left Egypt, right? Where everybody's leaving Egypt, it's the uh, death of the firstborn and people are ready to go. The morning comes and they leave. And uh, we understand, you know, we learn about, we've learned about this before. And Moses goes back and Moses, along with other people, other people carry the bones of Joseph with, with them out of Egypt. The 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 Pesach the uh, Passover sacrifice one year later that the Jewish people are now um, commanded to bring as a memory from leaving Egypt. We're now every year we have the we have a mitzvah of we have a commandment to bring the Paschal lamb sacrifice, which we don't today because we don't have a tabernacle, but but we have it on our Seder plate, right? We have this uh, shank bone or whatever we have on our Seder plates, but it's a memory of the Paschal sacrifice that we are supposed to bring and will bring one day when we had the third temple. So we have a mitzvah to bring the Paschal sacrifice. Unless you've been in contact with the dead, unless you have um, a spiritual, you've been spiritually affected by being in contact with the dead. So the people that carried the bones of Joseph out of Egypt are unable to bring that Paschal sacrifice because they've been in contact with the bones of Joseph. So they complain and they say, we want to do that. We want to bring the Paschal sacrifice. We want to be part of that. It's the same thing that Aaron was asking. I also want to bring that. I want to be close to God. I want to lift myself up. I want to be more than I am. I want more avenues to connect myself to God. And I don't have that one. And, th and they complain. And Moses goes to God. God comes back and he says, you know what? I'm going to institute a holiday called Pesach Sheni, a second Passover holiday for you so that when you've gone through your, your purification, so to speak, uh, rituals, etc., that you can bring the Paschal sacrifice and I'll give you an opportunity to do that. It's like the second chance. We have a second chance at doing something that we couldn't do before. And again, it's about yearning for connection. It, they wanted to be part of the community. They wanted to be part of the Jewish people. They wanted to be part of uh, the, uh, getting close to God through this mitzvah that was given to everybody else. And like Aaron, these people who had the the merit to carry the bones of Joseph are dis quote unquote discriminated against, can't bring that Paschal sacri sacrifice at the correct time. And so they ask God to help them. And he says, fine, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you another opportunity. So again, it's about, you know, like this interplay between us and God, right? Yet we think, okay, it's all fixed and it's the way it is. No, we have, we have, an, we have prayer. We have, we have way to kind of like interact with God and push things along and complain to God and, you know, and God answers us and says, you're right. You know, you, you need to have a, a second, a second opportunity, a second stab at this. So it gives them the, gives them the second, the second stab at it. So then the next thing we learn about in this week's Torah portion, after we've had the menorah and the lights and the, the raising up of, and the enlightening and the spirituality and, and, and being humble and, and Aaron, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, I meant to, but not only was Aaron um, very, very humble, but that the, the work that he did every single day when he lit that menorah, every single day he lit the menorah and cleaned up the ashes and lit the menorah, it was done, says our... 
uh, commenta commentaries, it was done with the same passion, with the same fire as the previous day. Like the first day he did it was really, 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 really exciting and he was really into it and he did it. And then the second day he did it with the same kind of passion, the same kind of fervor. It felt unique every single day. Something really special and something really something to learn about that uh, this is what Aaron was able to do. It says that he, that he had a, uh, a passion that didn't ebb. It was a, a, fer a fervor that continued every single day with the same level of passion. It didn't diminish, right? So, you know, we might be very excited about doing something one day, and then the next day we're not so excited about doing it, and probably two weeks later we're really not excited about doing it or something. Um, and I think, again, it's a lesson for our day about, you know, trying to in inject what we do and how we do it with the same level of excitement that it was on the first day when we did it, you know, the first day that you, that you, whatever it is, you know, that you change your grandchild's diaper, very exciting because you're excited to have a grandchild, but probably like three months later, maybe you're not so excited about changing that baby's diaper, but maybe there's a lesson to learn here. Like I should be so, or I could be, or I want to work at being super excited that I, that I have this grandchild, that I can continue to change their diapers, that I have, that maintain that level, maintain that level of passion and, 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 and inspiration that this is like an understanding of what you're doing and what you have the merit to do and that what you have the gift to do. So anyway, that, so that's the message, the message, one of the messages that we learn about the menorah. Um, humility, good envy, like an envious Aaron and the people who carried the bones of Joseph were envious in a good way. Like they wanted spirituality, they wanted to learn more, they wanted to be part of this, of this um, way to connect to God. So God says, okay, fine, so do it this way, do it with the menorah, do it with Pesach Sheni. Okay, let's keep going. Now we learn about the way in which the Jewish people traveled. We're about to, this is the first time the Jewish people are now traveling from Mount Sinai. They were at Mount Sinai for now, for now for over a year, and now it's time to move on. And what's going to, um, what's going to tell them how to move? How are they going to know how to move? They have manna coming from heaven. That's the food they're getting. They have water out of a rock. And, um, and now they have, and they are surrounded by, clouds they have clouds of glory that surround them it says there were seven clouds one on each side each of the you know north south east and west that's four one above them one below them and one way in front to lead them that was the they were the seven the four six seven that was seven clouds and there's also a fire a pillar of fire that would lead them at night so when it was time for the jewish people to move on there would be a miracle in the sense that god would raise up the raise up the cloud and it would start to move and the people knew okay it's time to get going and the trumpets would sound and there would be this great like scurrying around to pack up the mishkan the tabernacle and pack themselves up and get ready to move and they would move with the clouds they would move with the fire these were their ways this was their google maps this was their their um navigation system was the was the was the fire and the clouds that would lead them as they traveled in the desert they didn't know when they were going to move and they didn't know how long they would stay in each place so there was a trust that the Jewish people had to have that God had you know was was going to lead them appropriately and had a reason why they were going this way and that way and uh, when it was time to move on and when it was time and against against perhaps their own desire perhaps they had a desire like I like it here or like I've only been here a day I don't want to pack up again right I've only been here one day like it's like there were different periods of time that the Jewish people were in camp, sometimes for a short time, sometimes for a long time, but they didn't know how long they would be there. And it, in, in, in it, and it taught the Jewish people a certain level of trust that they had to have, that God would lead them appropriately, that it was the right time to go, that they had to leave, like here was time to go, or here was time to stay. I mean, maybe they wanted to leave. They didn't like this place. It wasn't time to leave. And so there was a trust and a letting go of being in control of where they were going and how they were going. Just like we have that trust in our ways, when we follow it, who knows where, we're following it on this Hudson, Henry Hudson Parkway and up here and down there and, uh, and we're following we trust that it's going to take us to our destination we might have we in um, you know 2020 have a, des a, no a desire we know where we're going but it's but here the the Jewish people in the desert they knew they were they were heading to the Holy Land but they didn't know how they were going to get there and so just like we trust our ways to lead us where we want to go and perhaps in the quickest way or the way with the least tolls or whatever it is um, 
so here the, the, the clouds and the fire are leading us and we are learning how to trust in God, how to know it's time to leave, how it's know it's time to stay and, and to follow God. And, and this idea of following God, this idea of trusting, and again, maybe we can relate that to our days today. Like we don't know what will be next week. We don't know where we're going with this COVID stuff. We don't know where we'll be in six months. Will we be in Shulam Rosh Hashanah? Will, be, will we be able to have school in the fall? We, like where's our journey? Where's our journey? And, and, and yes, you know, we, we, we talk platitudes about, you know, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And it is about the journey, but it's also in this week's Torah portion, we're being taught to recognize that God's with us. You know, we don't have the clouds and we don't have a fire showing us that God's in charge and God's leading us. Um, and yet, and yet, there, there are, you know, the way in which, in which this is heading and um, from, from that standpoint of understanding that, that God's here and God's, God's in charge and there's and there's a and there's a and there's a direction we're heading. We don't know where we're going, but can we trust and can we let go on some level? Do what I have to do, pick up and move when I have to pick up and move, and then stay when I have to stay. <laughs> and um so I think it's a very powerful um Torah portion to think about about um about this concept of they're coming out of Egypt. They're leaving somewhere, they're going somewhere, they're going to the land of Israel. Where where are we coming from? Where are we going? What's what's guiding us? Um what's protecting us? They had the clouds protecting us, they had the fire leading them. They had again this idea of fire. Go back to the beginning of the Torah portion about the menorah and the fire, and the fire being a good thing. It's a it's a flame, it's a candle, it's a light that reaches up, that goes up into the transcendent. And here's the flame. It's a good flame. It's a flame that's leading us. It's a flame that's warm. It's a flame that tells us, I I'm with you, follow me, come with me, trust me. I know where you're going and you need to follow me because that's the plan. And they did that they did that these jewish people did that and it's interesting because it says in the medrash in the commentators in the excuse me in the in the stories that some of the people that were in the whole camp encampment of the jewish people were known as the Erev Rav. these people were were known as quote unquote the mixed multitudes they were people they were Egyptians in Egypt and they saw all the plagues and they understood and they cleaved to Joseph. They wanted to be part of the Jewish people. They didn't want to be part of the of the Egyptians. And I understand that they um, they lived a little bit on their own in a separate play, a geographic section. They were circumcised like the uh, like the Jewish people were circumcised. They were also circumcised and they left with the Jewish people. They were known as the Erev Rav, um, the mixed multitudes. And they left with the Jewish people. They saw the miracles and they were so passionate and they really wanted to go with the Jewish people. And they went out with the Jewish people. So they caused trouble along the way. We're going to learn about that. But um, again, it sort of speaks about the idea of being inspired, having an inspiration, wanting to follow, saying, yes, this is, makes sense, I'm going to follow, but then can we continue with that passionate sense of inspiration? How long can we hold that? Can we hold it when it gets dark? Can we hold it when it's nighttime, when we can't see properly, when it's all murky and misty and dark and we don't know where we're going? Can we hold on to the vision? There's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful parable um, um, about, a, a little, a, about a man who's wandering, a woman, wandering in a forest and they don't know where they're going and it's pitch black, you can imagine, and all of a sudden it starts raining and it, there's even worse, you know, it's pitch black and it's raining and you're in the forest and you don't know how to get out and it's really feels very bleak. And all of a sudden there's a flash of lightning. There's a flash of lightning and that flash of lightning lights up the whole forest. And what happens is that the, the person can now see where they're going and they can see, oh, I'm supposed to go this way and this way and that'll get me out of the forest. And with that memory, that memory of the flash of lightning, they're able to navigate their way out. Or maybe there's another flash of lightning further down. But I, I think it speaks about these times of clarity that we might have, inspiration, clouds of like, I know God's here and I'm following God in the wilderness. I'm following God in my daily life in 2020, but then it gets dark and it gets plateaued and it, we, don't, we don't see God anywhere and we're like anxious and nervous. And that, but we, maybe one of the things we can do is go back to the time where we felt clarity. Remember those inspirational moments. Remember the inspirational people, you know, and, and, and sort of like hold on to that and remember that and kind of 
then you can maneuver perhaps in the in the right direction whatever whether the right direction is but with that clarity that you had back then hold on to that like let's let's use that when the times get dark when we're in the desert and we don't see where we're going when when it feels bleak right now it feels a little bleak i think like you think you don't, we don't know where we're going and um maybe we don't have a flash of lightning kind of a experience but we do have times in our lives i think most of us where we felt the hand of God in our lives and knowing that God's with us so maybe we need to hold on to those times and say like I felt it then I know it's here now and how do I reach out for that how do I reach up for that how do I light the menorah how do I light my own soul how do I inspire myself you know it's a lot about what we're doing for ourselves in this day and the people around us obviously all right so the people were um the people, the people, the people were mixed people. They were people who had come out fleeing from the Egyptians. All the uh, miracles, right? We had the, the inauguration of the Mishkan. They're now beginning to travel. They have the fire in front of them. They have the clouds. They have manna from heaven. They have water from a rock. They have pretty much everything they need. And um, there's, a, there's a, a really wonderful teaching by Rav Soloveitchik who talks about the difference between a camp a machiner, like the people who are in a camp because they're fleeing from something, like they become a, a, a camp because they have the similar enemy, they have the same fears, they're joined because they're fearful of the same thing, versus a congregation. A congregation, says Rabbi Soloveitchik, is a grouping that comes from a shared mission, that we have something in common, that we have a shared purpose, that we're part of the same plan, that we're on the same, we have the same kind of uh, um, value system, we have the same source of, where, of, of, our, of our knowledge, of our, of, our, of our destiny. We're in this together, not just because we're fleeing something or because we're frightened, but because we have something to look forward to together. We're a, we're a unity, we're an essence, we're one together. That's the difference, says Robert Soloveitchik, between a congregation and a camp. And the heir of Rav, who were these mixed multitudes, who were the non-Jewish people who came out with the who came out with the Jewish people, the, the, the Egyptians that came out, they lost resolve and they start to uh, to complain. They start to complain, and they start to complain. They complain about the travel that it's like too much to travel and it's like too hard to travel. They complain about the manna that the manna, the food that's coming from the heavens, this heavenly, divine, angelic food that apparently is white in color and it can taste like anything you want to. They're complaining about the food, this manna from heaven that is in the merit of Moses, Moses, our teacher, Moses, who is in, up in the higher heavens, Moses, who is teaching Torah and truth to the, to the people. In his merit comes this food. It's totally spiritual, completely 100% absorbed by the body. There's nothing wasteful about the, in, about the ingredients, about the manna. Like it completely gets absorbed into our body. We don't, there's no excrement. Um, there's no waste. It's all completely absorbed by by each of the uh, Jewish people going through the desert. It was perfect, perfect food. And the um, Erev Rav, this mixed multitude, start to complain. They complain about the travel. They complain about the food. And they instigate they instigate uh, complaints. And they, they become, and the word used in the Torah for them being complaining, are uh, that they are the misnononim. It's a reflexive word that they became complainers. Not just that they complained, <laughs> which is we can all complain, and we have a right. We have a right. We are um, maybe hardwired sometimes to complain, and that's okay to complain. But is it constructive complaining? Am I complaining because it's going to help me? Is it going to you know, unload my chest, or it's going to lead me to a solution? Is it constructive? Is it destructive? Does it consume me? Do I become a complainer so that everything I everything that happens to me is like is just ugh? You know, I'm going to complain about that and complain about that and can become complainers. So the air of Rav are known, are become misknown in them. They become complainers and they are a bad influence. And the Jewish people, some of them get mixed up with this, this desire for meat. So what's interesting about the, the uh, juxtaposition between the manna, which is this white, holy, angelic food that descends from the heavens and the meat that they ask for. They want, I read somewhere that what they wanted was they wanted to want 
Like they had everything. Like I just said, they had the clouds and the fire and the water and the man and they manna and they had everything. They didn't want for anything. And what they wanted was to want. They desired a desire. They wanted a desire. So they injected and what what's meat? Meat is red. There's something like earthy about it. Something very physical and and sort of like the antithesis of this spiritual white food was this this sort of meat and and red and uh, uh, and they wanted to want and they and they and they and they aroused complaints amongst the amongst the group so what are we learning here what are we learning here we're learning careful who you hang out with <laughs> you don't want to hang out with people who complain all the time who are like like their their nature is to complain the people who are going to take you away it's okay to complain. It's not like they're saying you should never complain, but is it constructive? Is it going to help you? Is it going to lead you somewhere? Is it going to maybe from a mental health standpoint, you need to complain sometimes, but can you find a solution? You know, are you looking for the good? Like these people had everything they wanted. And again, it's about pulling, pulling the Jewish people away, pulling us as a people away from connection to God. God's saying, I'm giving you everything. And they're saying, you know, but I need meat or I want something. And it was free in Egypt. They say this, they say it was free in Egypt. It was a crazy thing to say the, the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. They got food, but they were slaves in Egypt. And now they have the audacity to say that food that we had, the fish that we had, the melons, the, the garlic and the onions, whatever was free. So many, many, many of the commentators say what was free was free was that there were that they that they're harping on the fact that now this Jewish people are learning Torah <laughs> they're learning how to connect to God so yes they're free from the slavery from Egypt but in now they're moving into a place where they're learning how to be in relationship to God so the question is what's freedom we have many long conversations at our Seder table about what freedom is and uh, perhaps what resonates most with me is the sense that that not, freedom doesn't mean you can do anything you want, right? And if you let a child do whatever they want, it would be havoc. So within a certain structure, there's freedom. But there is a structure, there are boundaries, there are rules, you know, how you can live around other people, how you can live in the world, how, you know, they can't just do whatever you want. You know, that might be, you know, anarchy. <laughs> um, so what is freedom? So from the Jewish perspective, freedom is connecting to the source of freedom. Like, God, who is the source of spirituality, the source of everything, is the ultimate um, freedom, is it being connected to the infinite, to being connect connected to the source of everything. If we can connect ourselves to that, to God, to divine, to the, the, the transcendent, then we're truly free. We're not tied down. Like how many of actually are how many of us actually are free? Um, the the point at which a person exits this world, when we die, our soul leaves the physical realm it leaves our body and it goes up into the spiritual realm it it's free that's the ultimate freedom is when our soul the, is who we are right our soul leaves our body and it and it and it's and it's and it's free to be in relationship to god without the constraints without the body to like block the way and so here on earth in our domain right so part of becoming free is to is to connect ourselves to to the d the divine while we're still alive like how to do that shabbos they say the sabbath is a little bit of the world to come because it's it's a relationship to god it's a day where we like where we push the physical world aside and we sit in that time frame where it's a bubble of time where we have a relationship to each other to our souls to god to prayer to food like everything we bring we bring the physical and we elevate it like like in the beginning of the torah portion when moses is taking the taking an excuse me aaron is lighting the menorah he's lighting it like lighting it up like making it all glow making it all like not so bound to the physical something that transcends and goes up and has something something magical and beautiful and 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 divine about it is a, is a goal is a goal like how to get there so perhaps it's about like setting aside a day shabbos as a day to get in touch with our souls and get in touch with god and fire ourselves up so we can take that into the week and perhaps it's about it's about it's about um maybe it's about gratitude when we talk about manna and all the things that god gave us and yet we're still we're complaining we're taking ourselves away the era of rab the mixed multitude is taking us away like no it's not enough you have to have meat you have to have something red you have to have a desire you have to go after your lusts do we 
do we? Do we? <laughs> I don't know. Do we? Can we be happy with what we have? I mean, again, I, I don't want it to be fickle and I don't want, but, but on some level, you know, like enough, like what do we need? What do we lust after? And can we curtail those lusts? And can we be grateful and happy and feel fulfilled with what we have? Can we be fulfilled with the manna that's coming from heaven or not? And so I think that, you know, this idea of the mixed multitudes coming in and, um, and, and creating a complaint, there's a complaint nature of this Erev of this mixed multitudes that infiltrates into our congregation. So do we have the same mission? Do we have the same goal? What are we trying to do? We're trying to learn Torah. We're trying to follow God wherever he goes. No, we're following. We're like, we're learning. We're following. We're like, again, we're like the sheep. We're still in the sheep. And then we become an ox. And then we become a twins by the time we get to the month of Sivan and we get the Torah. But this progression, like we start have to learn to start walking on our own, but we also still have to recognize that God's with us every step of the way. So when the, when the people start, when these people start complaining and the Jewish people start complaining, they want they want meat. They don't want the manna anymore. They want meat. They want something else. They want something different. And um, and there's something about that lesson that we could bring with us today. And it also says that the, the Jewish people, when they left Sinai, were like, it says in the Medrash, that we were like children running away on the last day of school. You know, when that, maybe it can't really relate to that today anymore, but when that final bell at the end of the semester rings and the children run outside because they're so happy to be done with school now maybe they want to run back to school but at, you know in the old days when the bell would ring and the children would leave school i remember it myself I was so happy to be free so happy to go away from the rules of school and having to sit and learn and you know, and and i wanted to be free i didn't want to be in school anymore and now we recognize the importance of being in school. But, 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 the, but the point is, that it says like the Jewish people, when they left Sinai, they were like children running away from school. We were like, we don't give it, don't give me any more mitzvahs. <laughs> I have enough. Don't give me any more. And it's so interesting because it's so con con like in contrast to Aaron, who at the beginning of the Torah portion says, I want to bring the sacrifices like the rest of the tribes. And I, you, I don't have that to do. Or the people who are carrying the bones of Joseph. And they say, we didn't get to bring the Passover sacrifice. We want to do that too. And God's saying, okay, I'll give you the Pesach Sheni. I'll give you the second chance. I'll give you the menorah and I'll give you the blessing of the people. And now we have, we have you know, us walking through the desert and following God with the clouds and the and the fire and we start to complain We're complaining about the about the, the the spiritual earthy spiritual excuse me the spiritual angelic food we're complaining about the angelic food we're complaining that to live on a high spiritual level is maybe too much for us maybe we can't live at that high level we have to eat meat we have to eat something that's red and in the in the physical world maybe that's too much maybe to live like Moses is too much for us and as we keep going through the Torah portion what happens next is um, we learn about we learn about Moses and how Moses says I can't carry these people it's too much for me like like I don't know how to keep this Jewish people on a high spiritual level right I don't know how since I'm in my merit comes the manna the manna comes out of the of the heavens because because of Moses teaching Torah to the people and the people are like running away. <laughs> the people are running away and Moses says, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he even asked to die. He says, kill me. I can't carry these people on my own. Like I didn't give birth to them. I can't carry them. And what does God do? God says, okay, I'll give you 70 elders, 70 elders and some of your light, some of your prophecy will go onto those people. And we have this concept of smicha. I don't know if you've heard of that term, but smicha is where somebody becomes a rabbi and the, um, the, um, the uh, school that is conferring or rabbis that are conferring the uh, a rabbi title onto their student will let, place their hands on top of their student and give them smicha like bestow upon them the uh, the the title the the accolade the 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 accolade the um, the the level of being called rabbi right now you have reached this level of knowledge and understanding and connection to God that you get to be called rabbi and it's conferred with a procedure whereby the, they put your hands on top of the head and you and you confer smicha onto the student. So Moses is conferring smicha onto these 70 elders. Who are the 70 elders? It's crazy who these 70 elders are. These 70 elders were people in Egypt 
who were the overseers of the Jewish people. They were Jewish people who were given the task by the Egyptians of uh, making sure that the rest of the Jewish people, the slaves, did their work. And if they didn't do their work or didn't um, make the right amount of bricks or quota or whatever they were supposed to do, then these, these overseers would have to um, beat and whip the people under their, under their charge. And they refused to do that. They took the beating instead of giving beating. So the Egyptians would come along and say, you know, where's all the bricks that we, and they, and they say, well, you know, we did the best they can. And the, for, the overseers would be beaten for not um, forcing or pushing or making their, their uh, workers work harder. And they couldn't bring themselves to beat the, a fellow Jew. They would rather take the beating from the Egyptians than beat a fellow Jew. Those and it says um, it says in our proverbs. Where's the saying I wanted to read to you? It says in the proverbs that um, something about sharing the burden about 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 the high level it is to share in others' burdens, to have empathy for another person. How high of a level that is to empathize with the other, and that's what these seventy elders who are going to now become the um, the, the helpers of Moses in the desert, these 70 leaders showed that they shared in the burdens of the Jewish people by taking beatings instead of giving beatings to the slaves in Egypt, that they would refuse to do that and they got beaten in their stead. So that level of empathy, that level of connection to the Jewish people was, 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 was recognized as something so truly um, wonderful and magnificent that they became the 70 elders and and Moses transfers some of his prophecy so to speak onto them and again it's like lighting the candle it's not like he diminished his prophecy by giving it over but that it's again it's lighting and raising up like lifting up and there's even an idea that every single person in the congregation I'm going to use the word congregation instead of camp because camp again according to Soloveitchik is just um, a fear-based group versus a congregation that has a common mission, a common value. We have a common like, like um, purpose. And so this congregation, according to many commentators, every single person in that congregation had the capacity and the ability to be a leader, had capacity to be somebody who could connect to God on a very high level. And so too, again, bring it down to our day, every single one of us has that capacity to bring ourselves close, to bring ourselves up, to keep pushing ourselves along. I was talking to someone recently who was saying, you know, like I'm in co I'm in lockdown and I don't see a lot of people. I don't do a lot of things. I don't I don't go out there and do the things I used to be doing and I'm feeling very badly about that. And I and one of the things that I learned that I shared with her was really helpful is that um is that at the end of the day and there's a lot of stories about this, but at the end of the day, who is it that we um can affect, that we can change? And uh, really, it, it, it's uh, the the job starts at home it, it, with us, which is one of us. Like, we get birthed into the world, and we get we sort of birth ourselves into the next world. And this bridge of life that we're on now, you know, we don't know how long it's going to last for each one of us. But that, but what? Who are we? We going to be each one of us individually? Who are we going to be when we're done? When we birth ourselves into the next world? And so the work starts at home, right? We can try to change everybody else and try to inspire everybody else, but it starts at home. Light your own fire, you know. Learn your own Torah, like do whatever it is that you that you need to do to work on yourself to to be less angry to be more giving to be whatever it is to be more loving of oneself to more compassionate of oneself and recognize that we are created in the image of god and each one of us has a meaning and a need even if we're not doing a lot out in the world that god needs us and god loves us and god's with us so that point um is I think very, very powerful because we might feel like oh, I'm not doing anything because I'm not out in the world doing stuff, but just being and the fact that we are still here and God is still flooding us. So uh, each one of us with love and light, that that's, that's huge, like God loves us, God needs us. And that's where it starts. So Moses, 
Again, it's amazing. It fits right in with this Torah portion. Moses says, I can't do this alone. Like he feels so alone and he prays out to God. He says, I can't carry this. People are like complaining and I don't know what to do. And he's like beyond. He's like he's bursting. Like I can't do this. And God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Like can we... Can we really believe that? Can we really know that, that God's with us? You know, and, and another thing that I really want to mention is the idea that when people die of COVID, um, a lot of people say, I'm so sad that they died alone, that I wasn't with them, like children who couldn't be with their parents when they died or siblings when they couldn't be with their siblings when they died. And, and yes, there is a concept of being with a person when they die, but there's also a concept that when a person's sick, when a person's sick, the divine presence, the shechina, the, de the, the feminine presence rests with that person, is over the head of the person, which is actually why, why we pray, in the pre when you go to visit a sick person, you should pray for the sick person in the presence of the sick person, because the shechina is there. Just like there's a custom, or a custom, there's a, a thing about praying at a chuppah, because the divine presence descends on a chuppah. Divine presence descends at a brit milah when there's circumcision. There's a lot of people praying when the circumcision is happening because the divine presence is there. So similarly, when we visit a sick person, divine presence is there. Pray, pray for the sick person, pray for other sick people, pray for whatever. Pray, because the divine presence is there. Shechina, the divine feminine presence is present there on that with that sick person. So even if you're, you as a, as, a, as a living person cannot be with a person who's dying, um, there is great comfort in knowing that the divine presence is there. And as the person's soul leaves, and it leaves in stages, but as that divine soul starts to leave the body, it starts to move up into the hell, right? it sees the souls of their pre-deceased relatives and loved ones coming to meet them, coming to greet them, coming to bring them into the world to come. So. Again, we could say, I'm so, I feel so bereft that bereft of my loved one, which I am, but I wanted to be there when they died and I feel like I, I, I abandoned them. And the Jewish tradition is teaching us that there, that there is, can perhaps be comforted by the fact that divine presence is there and the souls of the predeceased relatives and friends come to meet them and greet them and bring them into the world to come. So, so yes, they're leaving you behind, but they're moving into these higher realms. And they, they, that's the ultimate freedom, right? So we talked about freedom. That's the ultimate freedom going, uh, going in that direction. And actually people who have near-death experience that get brought to life, they're actually uh, reported many, many times that they didn't want to come back. That they that they that they were so attracted by what they were going towards that when they were brought back it was like oh but they had a mission they had something to do and there are a lot of stories about that so it's pretty inspiring that stuff anyway so um, so I want to mention something else about uh, about um, when people die because uh, as I'm an active member of the Chavah Kedisha I want to tell you that one of the things that we say when we finish so you know the English word is a coffin the Hebrew word is an aron it's an ark. We put the body, which is the house, like the Torah scroll, we put the Torah scroll in our arcs, in our synagogues, right? We put the body, which is like a image of, you know, the image of God, we put that in an Aaron, we put it in an ark. And when we close the ark, this is what we say, we say what's exactly in this week's Torah portion, we say, when the ark would journey, Moses said, okay, and, and here it is, arise Hashem and let your foes be scattered, let those who hate you flee from before you. And when it rested, he would say, reside tranquilly, O Hashem, among the myriad thousands of Israel. And that's what we, that's what, sorry, that's what we say when we close the Aaron on a coffin. We say this exact saying that's in this week's Torah portion. And this week's Torah portion, that's that, those words, and perhaps they're ones you've heard of, the heave and so on. Aaron v'yomer Moshe. We sing it in Shul. Kuma Hashem v'yafutu v'yanech. It's when we take the, the the Torah scroll back to the Ark that we sing this 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 thing, and it's bracketed. It's two sentences bracketed by um, upside down nuns. The letter nun inverted. So if you look in the Torah scroll, if you look in the Chumash, look in the Bible, you want to see. You'll see that there's a nun that's turned upside down, then we have these two sentences, and then there's another nun turned upside down at the other side, and it brackets these two verses. So these two verses are about God being with us. 
when you when you when you travel when the ark travels that god is with you and he's going to scatter your foes and he's going to reside with you and you will reside tranquilly and that's what we pray for when the body is being moved when we take the aron and we put the lid on it and we say we say you know this is an aron that's going to move with god in attendance and this is an aron that's going to be tranquilly moved and 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 live tranquilly forever like it's amazing amazing and we say that in synagogue when we put the Torah away and we say it over a coffin over an Aaron when we put the lid on we say the same thing and it's here in this week's Torah portion and it's bracketed by the end that by these nuns so nun is a letter that is uh, is an interesting letter but it, one of the words that the letter that this letter is the beginning of is the word for fallen for fallen so and it and, and it appears in this week's Torah portion between the three different complaints that the Jewish people had or the Erevav had. They had the complaints about the manna. They had the complaints about, you know, let's get out of Mount Sinai. Let's leave so we don't get more mitzvahs, more, more commandments. And it's also um, the, the complaints about traveling and having to pack up and, uh, and travel for three days. It's such a hardship that, that there were three complaints and that this, these two sentences appear, they break up the three. They break it up so that it doesn't keep the the potential to fall doesn't continue to have the same energy. Break up the complaints with God's with you. Break it up because the more you complain, the more you slide down that complaining slide, slippery slope. So break it up, and God breaks it up with this sentence, and it's the same sentence that we say when we bet when we put the the lid on a on a coffin. So I think it's just important to say that. <laughs> um, so we're wandering in the desert. How are we doing on time? Right, 10 minutes. Um, they wanted me, they got that. So, so uh, they're, they're traveling and God's with them. And Moses says, I'm, I can't do this alone. And God says, don't worry, I'm with you. Give you the 70 elders. They're people who share the burdens in Egypt. They're people who have a high ca uh, capacity to connect to an empathy for the Jewish people. Again, empathy, like such a high level to be at, to feel really empathetic. Again, a message for today, how to feel empathy for the other, how to know the other so we can feel empathy for the other. Um, and then we have the episode where because Moses is so elevated because he's so spiritual he was he went up into the heavens he spoke to god face to face he did not get his prophecies through a dream or through a vision it was face to face so to speak whatever that means that he was a different level of prophet than anybody ever and so miriam and uh his sister and aaron um have a conversation about the fact that moses is separating sexually from his wife tipora that in order to be ready to be in contact with God every single moment of any single day he couldn't have sexual relationships with his wife and so he separates from his wife and somehow Miriam heard about it um, and um, and she says something to Aaron about it and here is where we learn again about the the ills of speaking about other people of lush and horror of speaking ill of another person and even Miriam, who is so loving of, of Moses, like, like, they, like she saved him from the bulrushes and she, you know, brought her mother as the wet nurse when Moses gets pulled out of the bulrushes by Batia, the daughter of Pharaoh, and goes into the palace and comes back. And Mir Miriam, Miriam, Miriam's always there watching over her little brother Moses and like such a loving presence. Even Miriam, who had a good like heart and was not not trying to bring Moses down even when she spoke this to Aaron she gets afflicted with this um this physical ailment called Sarah's that we learned about before and she has to be quarantined she has to leave the camp and and go through a process of remorse and regret and to shuva like return and she has to leave the camp for a week and the people wait for her moses waits for her and the people wait for her because she is such see she 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 did the wrong thing and she got afflicted 
and she had to stand outside the camp, but people are waiting for her. What a concept of waiting. Like a Jewish people, where Jewish people wait? We're waiting for COVID to be over. Everybody's waiting for COVID to be over. We're waiting for the Messiah to come. We're waiting for, you know, the world to come. We, wait, we, have, we have a concept of waiting as much as we're doing and going. And again, it's about the journey. Is it the journey? Is it the destination? In the journey, there's aspects of waiting. We're waiting. And these Jewish people waited for Miriam and Moses, about whom she spoke, is also waiting. Just like she waited on the banks for him, he's going to wait for her. And that relationships get re-cemented. Interesting, you know, like like when we when we wait for other people, when we have patience with other people, when we and maybe sometimes in this day and age, it's, now it's a little hard to be patient. It's hard to wait, um, but we're learning, right? <laughs> we're learning to wait. We don't know what will be. We're waiting. We have faith. Hopefully, um, we can like you know wait this out, or we can do what we need to do, but. This idea of them waiting. And then what does Moses do? He prays for her. And this is the first prayer for healing. And her, his prayer is very, very, very short. It says, Moses cried out to God saying, please Hashem, heal her now. That's his prayer. It's like this. It's little. It's not a whole big embellishment. It's just heal her. Enough. You know, like it's a, again, it's a relationship. It's a prayer. The need to pray, the need to connect, the need to say like, like we need to, you know, um, help help my sister pray right even though she brought it on herself pray you know I, I'm thinking a little bit about um, some of the Jewish people in New York mostly I think that we've read about where they were defying the laws of being in quarantine and they were still having weddings and they were still whatever they were doing and they would get sick and then people would say yeah you know like they deserved it or it was it's their fault or something so maybe here there's a different there's a benefit of the doubt to be had where Miriam she did say the wrong thing about Moses she didn't mean to she didn't know what she didn't know that she, what she was saying was maybe so bad maybe she had a purpose for it maybe she had a you know again make up a scenario where there's a benefit of the doubt analysis where she she gets on the side of righteousness and that's where she was coming from however it was the wrong thing to do and she ended up sick and the, and they people wait and they pray and so therefore mm, shouldn't we be praying for each other we for sure should be praying for each other as much as you know we might bring upon ourselves um you know, sickness or whatever, like we should just sort of pray for people and we should sort of wish them well, want them to be better, want them to be elevated, want them to get out of their dire situations, that for sure. Go back to the idea of the of these elders who had um this amount of empathy and, and how and how and how um inspiring that is to be a person with empathy and a person like Moses who prays or like the whole Jewish people waiting for Miriam. These are amazing lessons. Um Pray and wait, benefit it out. So there's, I think that, that what I'll do now is I'll bring it all back together. So I think that when I think about all these different episodes, and I didn't mention them all, there are some other things that happen in this week's Torah portion, but basically we have the idea of menorah, of the, of the lamp, of the light, of the fire, of rising up, of being elevated, of like being passionate, air and being humble, and also being able to spread light and being able to do it with passion and fervor and with the same amount of um, of excitement and uniqueness every single day, like make your day unique, make your day passionate, make your day in your mind meaningful. And that he had an envy for other people, which was a good envy, envy, I want to be more whatever I want to be I want to be like that I want to be able to um, bring that sacrifice I want to be able to bring that Passover sacrifice says the people who carried the bones of Joseph out of Egypt like they wanted to do it too and they complained they asked God and God said okay here's what you do here you get the second chance you get a second chance to do over the sacrifice um, at the Passover sacrifice but Aaron you get menorah you get that forever like it's going to go through the generations we're still got Hanukkah we're still lighting the menorah we're still bringing that light every year um, the Hashmanayim were descendants of Aaron he continues to be the source of lighting the menorah bringing that light spreading it learning that lesson elevating ourselves going into a transcendent place um, 
And then we have this following God in the desert with the clouds and the fire and, and recognizing that God's with us, that God's leading us. And even though it might be uncomfortable and even if we might not want to, that there's a higher purpose to be served. Um, this this uh, juxtaposition of the congregation with a camp that the congregation has a shared mission, a shared purpose, and that we want to be part of that because it's all, it's not about me, it's about us, it's about the whole group. And yes, it's about me also and who I'm going to be as I, as I, as I, as I, journey through life as I journey through life what are the what are the campments in my life and how do I learn from that and where am I going and what am I learning as I go along and the desire for freedom is it is it true freedom is it freedom from enslavement is it freedom to be in relationship to God which who is the source of ultimate freedom that kind of concept of going towards God as a way to be free ultimately and then the idea of um, the complainers and, and what we complain about and whether we become complainers, break it up. Like one complaint leads to another, leads to another. God in the Torah breaks it up with this, that, that God's along with us, that God's coming along, that he's with us, that he's imminent as much as we recognize that he's with us that, and, 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 and to know that and to pray to him and to complain to him and to or maybe not even use the word him because it because that's the fem, the masculine aspect of god that to play to the shina play pray for healing pray for um the, the healing of the world you know at this point it's so it's so pervasive everywhere um to not become a complainer and yet recognize what needs to be fixed and to pray for those things or work for those things work for justice work for equality work for recognizing the the um the uh the image of god in all people um and uh not not pursuing the uh the lustful desires of meat like they want meat like maybe maybe not do that like we don't need we don't need to follow all of our of our of our desires um and uh not to speak lush and horror to be careful like what are we listening to like can we blot it all out can we listen to the trumpets the trumpets that declared that it was time to move on right time to move on can we hear the trumpets what's the noise that's coming in through our ears what are we listening to what are we hearing so at the end of the day i think it's about yearning for something what is it that we're yearning for what do we have a passion for do we have a trust in god are we able to be empathetic to each other are we able to put Shabbos, Torah, Jewish people in the center of our world or, or, or people who are downtrodden, like what's at the center of how we think and what we do, um, not to gossip, to pray and to know that God's with us. And I think that's a lot for this week's Torah portion. Um, next week, I think I'm going to teach on Monday. I have something else on Tuesday and um, I hope that that was, uh, that was an interesting share.